If I wasn't in a band, I'd go total Marlon Brando, put on 20 stone, wear a nappy. That's what I've done. Yeah. Buy an island and just <laughs> fucking eat myself to death, <laughs> quite happily. My name is John Doran and I write about music. In this series for Noisy, I have been interviewing outliers in their field. British masters, ranging from Brian Ferry to Tricky, from Johnny Marr to Gary Newman. This week I'm talking to Nicky Wire, the main spokesman for Welsh rock band Manic Street Preachers. The Manics emerged in the early 90s, antagonising nearly everyone they came across with their fearsomely anti-fashion stance. They espoused a homespun philosophy of culture, alienation, boredom and despair wrapped in fake leopard skin and lipstick. They rejected slacker culture in favour of proud working class intellectualism and self-determination. Forget the libertines. Manic Street Preachers are the last truly great British mainstream rock band. Today it's my pleasure to introduce Nicky Wire of Manic Street Preachers. Hello. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks sir. Now, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, middle age starts at 45, which mm. is next year for, for, yeah, for you. I kind of, I, I think at the age of 42, I think of myself as being middle aged already, to be honest. Yeah. I've got to let you into a secret. I love it. I think it's great. Are you not? You haven't got to go up on stage in a leopard print miniskirt and makeup and play well, in Well, you know, people, sometimes yeah. when I go out in Vauxhall, you know. <laughs> no, I really felt after that show we did at the O2, I just remember thinking, how wonderful it was, but really, it, you know, I'm not quite sure if I, if I believe this is going to happen again, you know. How long can you sustain going on stage in uh, a pair of women's glitter leggings as I did those? Snakeskin leggings, I think they were, <laughs> and a school blazer. So, in a way, it must have come as a relief for you to do in what is, to all intents and purposes, an unplugged album, because there's not yes. that much call for doing star jumps during <laughs> introspective ballads about growing older, Sang is Sang by Welsh female folk singers, <laughs> yeah. It, it's, um, it's actually been really weird rehearsing it, because we're looking at each other, and we've all got acoustic guitars, and there's brass sections, and like, <laughs> With Jim, we're like, well, James, where's the solo? And <laughs> <laughs> where's the point where you put your foot on the monitors? And the, it's also delicate and intimate and raw and honest. It's, you know, it's lovely when you make an album like that, but when you've actually got to talk about it and play it live, it becomes quite, quite soul destroying. I hope when I go and watch you live that I'm going to see somebody throw a banjo into a speaker stack. <laughs> In protest? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think the album is, is kind of very severe in its warmness. I think it's quite unsettling at times, especially the lyrical content. The kind of cruelty of self awareness is, does permeate this album, which is reaching 44 and still being totally enthralled with the rock and roll dream, but realizing it may be over. There's a lot of, of references on the album to kind of, I can't fight this war anymore, time to surrender, time to move on. And um, that's, we do feel a bit like that. We feel a bit beaten because out of all our generation, there's just there's no one left who cares. Everyone's just reformed or split up or reformed again and just peddling nostalgia, which is fair enough, you know. I'd, I'd advise all bands to do it because it's a much easier way of making tons of money. If we'd split up, you know, 10 years ago and we're coming back now, I'm sure we'd be a lot richer for it. But. Uh, we kind of like this arena version of the fall where we just keep ploughing on through the shite. Yeah. <laughs> you know, releasing records all the time. You know, as much as I do like the new record, and I really do like the new record, when I read that the new album invoked the Holy Bible and Journal for Plague Lovers, and I've got to say I found that extremely exciting news. So what can you tell me about it's definitely the yin and yang, you know, the, the second album, which is called Futurology, is very kind of post-punk, jagged, but also kind of like, this is not a love song, it has this last sort of disco beat sometimes as well behind it. The album obviously isn't going to be the same kind of spiritually and psychologically as the Holy Bible was, is it? No. It's why we have a problem playing songs live off the Holy Bible, because it's a complete state of mind. You have to be so well drilled, like you literally have to hate your audience. Yeah. to play those songs. Uh, you have to hate everyone, you know. You've only got to look at a performance at Glastonbury in 94 if you want to see a band that is nothing but pure hatred for everything around them. I say build some more fucking bypasses over this shithole. 
I don't want to state the obvious, but 1994 was obviously a year of kind of great highs and great lows for Manning Street Preachers. And I, th I think the opinion for long-term fans of the band is the last three gigs you did as a four-piece just at Christmas yes. in 1994 were probably the most enjoyable gigs uh, to, to be watch. in the audience <laughs> for. <laughs> yeah. How, how was it for you, though? Uh, just the most terrifying gigs ever. They were awful. I mean, it was you're just watching a band implode on stage. Having said that, as a fan of rock music, I would love to be watching it. But actually being the main, one of the main participants, they was just racked with friction. Uh, you know, it was just like the end of the road, really. Not in terms of hating each other, it was just everything was so tense and uptight. And you're playing these songs that are, are becoming self-fulfilling prophecies. When, when you record them, you don't f it's, it's still the creative process is just really exciting. But when you, then we, we played them for six months and you're just thinking it's actually all coming true. Everything's unraveling. The footage that's taken from the balcony upstairs yeah. is a bit shaky, but even from that shaky footage, you can see that it was a blistering gig. Yeah. And like even, you know, Rich, he seemed to be fully engaged and like looking like a rock star again. Oh, he looks again. absolutely amazing on this. Um, and the great thing uh, is though, in typical Mannix, which people never quite get about us, is like halfway through that set, James comes on and does Last Christmas and Bright Eyes. <laughs> yeah. It does sum us up more than anything, but you know, yeah. there's that, you know, fireball of intense hatred, but we've always walked that line of- Le Leavened um, with some wham. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and that, that ridiculous, like some people will say that we shouldn't do Strictly Come Dancing or something like that. that it's, Richie would never have done it. Well, we did everything at the start with Richie. We talked yeah. to Glove Puppets, me and Richie, yeah. on Saturday morning TV. If I just tantalise you with that a little bit, would you? Give a little smile or something? No, he's not as pretty as my dog. I've grown much prettier dog than that. Is he like him? See, I've like pecked up now. Look, you see that? A little toy. We did all those kind of Saturday morning shows. It's a rite of passage for a oh. band, isn't it? I feel sorry for bands who don't get to do that these days. Go, go on a kid's TV, out of the mind. You know, on. Saturday mornings, I feel so bad for my children because all they've got are ugly moralizing chefs on the TV who I fucking despise telling me how to eat. You know, these people have ruined music. It's yeah, like yeah, Mumford yeah. and Sons obviously eat really well. And that's why the music's so fucking awful. I think Kirk Cobain was eating well when he was making <laughs> in utero. Bad food equals good music. Well People did throw a paddy when you did Strictly Come Dancing, but you've done another one in New Zealand recently, haven't you? you did. Oh, when we went to watch the British Lions, yeah, we hopped over to New Zealand, did a show and did the New Zealand X Factor. Melanie Blatt was one of the judges. It was like the 90s all over again. find it in Congress or is there a kind of sense no. of perversity, you know, doing a song about, you know, fascism or whatever on uh, New Zealand national TV? Well, I think if you've got something to say in your songs, I mean, a lot of bad, uh, people who won't do stuff like that are literally talking about nothing, which is bizarre, isn't it? They feel like they can get away with just banging a fucking floor tom at the front of the stage going, whoa, whoa, and that's all right. And licensing their song for an advert. It just doesn't add up, does it? In a way, when the BNP ended up using, if you tolerate this, your children will be next, it was kind of quite a good thing, really, because it really pointed out just how fucking stupid they are. You couldn't say it better, yeah. You know, I, I didn't even feel the need to, to say anything, really. <laughs> you know, it's such a self-defeating exercise, isn't it? Right, using a song about uh, people going to fight in the Spanish Civil War against fascism. That I just—it's almost some kind of surrealist joke. <laughs> um, just absolutely fucking baffling. Uh, so, like I said, it's just so self-defeating. I didn't feel—you feel, you know, you feel offended, but it's just so stupid. Like you said, it, you almost feel it, it works as as showing out, showing the stupidity of it and of them. Another live adventure you had during 1994 was playing Bangkok, wasn't it? Yeah, it was another horror show. And I believe that you spent the night worried you were going to get beheaded. <laughs> well, I did. <laughs> I don't even like to talk. It still fills me with dread because for some reason we did repeat. 
and I said something very, very disparaging about the Tai Roy family. Which I mean, it should be pointed out for this, that this is a really serious deal in Thailand. Really serious, which I didn't realise the consequences. And they said the police were going to come and arrest me because you can you literally be locked up for you know defamation of the, of the, of the monarchy. And I've never gone to, back to that, even the airport, because I think I might probably will be arrested. For the next three days, I literally hid under my bed. And um, the military police, the footage of it is amazing, because the crowd is going insane. We, we, and we didn't realize how big we were out there. We did two nights. Yeah. And it was, it was real kind of mania. We did a sign-in session. It literally took us 12 hours. It was just, must have been about 6,000 people just turned up. And um, it was boiling hot. And um, again, it was, that sort of faster had come out, I think, and the enemy was with us, and um, that was just the most awful trip I've ever had. I just desperately couldn't wait to get home. It took us a long time to recover from that. So, faster had just come out. Now, for me, faster, I've got to say, it's just like the peak of like, rock music in the 90s. What it looks to me like is, is there's like a huge conflict going on in there as it speaks of deep unhappiness within the band but also of a, an excitement at what potential there still is in being in a band. Yeah, and I think you can also see the acceleration of... Um, when you consider it was a pre-digital age, you know, Richard never had a phone or a computer or anything, but you can see his mind is just swirling at such an unbelievable rate and he's consuming so much culture in an old-fashioned way, you know, like going to libraries, watching telly and reading books. And I think that song, it kind of accelerates the, the, the kind of self-demise of the band. That by the time you get to the end, there's something, it's like a band eating itself. It was already popular and for the, the levels of intensity and how kind of loud and angry that song was, it was already big, but of course it must have been helped by a certain Top of the Pops performance. Now, hmm. again, as a band who sit around and discuss every move that they, before they make it, there must have been some discussion about, is it actually a good idea for us to go on, for James to go on wearing a balaclava? <laughs> for once, I'd have to say it was the one time we'd actually, this is like, I guess we were so deluded in our isolation that we didn't see anything wrong or not controversial about it at all because we obviously tip x james's name on there <laughs> I, I think we had a bypass we were so mentally exhausted at that point that we didn't quite realize the implications of having the most complaints ever uh, you know over top of the pops and we were just so apocalypse now at this point the look we had all these massive fireballs going on. i remember singeing a bit in my hair when one of those it was like metallica <laughs> and singed a bit in my hair and i'm i look at it now and i just it kind of scares me a bit watching that video. In a way, it's almost good that you've got the camera cutting away to Vic Reeves and Bob Morton <laughs> acting like idiots, <laughs> like, you know. And, and James, although he does look like a terrorist, he looks like a terrorist who's just been packed off by his mum, you know. <laughs> <laughs> with his name tag on the outside of his balaclava. <laughs> it's a great, I mean, I miss Top of the Pop so much. I know, it makes me sound incredibly old, but it just, um, it was such a main line, it's such, such an easier world then. When did this thing about you hoovering enter the popular consciousness? We, when we won the Brit Awards, I wore a t-shirt saying, I, I heart hoovering. Now, how long ago was that? It was for Everything Must Go, 1997. And uh, I guess that was my uh, kind of situationist statement but now, amongst the glory of Britpop. Now that you are uh, a young at heart, live in body, middle-aged man, what do you do with your spare time? Um, I do a lot of cleaning. Still? Oh yeah, I am a, you know, it's exceptionally tidy house, tidy mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very clean house. There's a lot of flash wipes, a lot of bleach. I'll tell you what's good about being old. Do you know what? I don't even know who Miley Cyprus is. <laughs> I don't even care. <laughs> Do you know what? I've been watching everyone on Facebook and Twitter going, I'm like, who the fuck is this Miley Cyprus? I don't even know who she is. 
It's okay. Miley Cyrus, not Cyprus. All right, okay. Well, you know, even five years ago, some music channels, I'd be like, oh my God, I don't know who this woman is. I'm going to look like such a twat. And now mm. I don't care. I've sang you know. a few of their songs with my daughter, so I do know. All oh, right. So, so you, you have to worry about these things still. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, because it's getting that age. But I've still got to sometimes engage with young people. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in terms of being in a band. So try and transfer that intensity when you're knocking on a bit. Yeah. And believe it. It's something we really kind of wrestle with every hour. I mean, obviously, next year we've been offered tons of money to play the Holy Bible. It's the 20 years since anniversary. Yeah. And we, you know, we could really make tons of money just playing the whole album. But the minute we do it, we are, I'm not saying we won't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it kind of feels like, oh, well, that's it. We're irrelevant now. Yeah. We still. And, you, and you've, you've got the. Another album to come out. You've and got Futurology coming out. Yeah. So. It's such a fine line, you know. Well, I wanted to say thanks very much for Cheers doing this. It's always a pleasure. pleasure as always. And would you mind signing this for me? At all. What's on the B-sides of this? Democracy Coma? Yeah. Stay Beautiful Live? It is, yeah. Obviously, now, Love Sweet Exile is a weird song, isn't it? Yes. When we did that at the O2, James was like fucking Stevie Vai, you know, <laughs> the yeah. guitar solo. It's yeah, like, yeah. like, did you very really speed that when you did it? You went, fuck off. Don't accuse me of that. I can play fast still. <laughs> Cheers.